Now we're going to continue our look at what Atlas Comics, later known as Marvel, was putting out in early 1956. And in case you've already started to wonder at this point, why are we spending so much time talking about, specifically, 1956? Well, there's a very specific reason, and we're going to be getting to it soon. But first, I just wanted to take, like I said, a look at where everybody was and what was going on. In January, uh, January 56, at least for the cover date of the books, because also that's, that's the month that Judgment Day came out in the final batch of EC Comics. So EC goes off the scene as a, uh, an, well, I was going to say an indirect result, but almost as a direct result of the formation of the Comics Code Authority. Well, anyway, we looked at several things that uh, Atlas had going on. Now we're going to take a look at the war comics. And you'll remember, DC had about half a dozen. Atlas has got easily twice that many. I may have actually missed one or two. And this isn't the only screen. So we've got Battle. Battleground, Battle Action, Battlefront, Marines in Battle. And also Marines in Action. And then we've got some individuals to focus in on. Devil Dog Dugan, Combat Casey, and Combat Kelly. And probably the lead war comic for Atlas, War. In which war is so emphasized that in the title... It says war twice. So, yeah, all this stuff. And let's not forget the sailors, shall we? Navy combat and Navy action. Now, these war books, these were not like the EC comics. War books. See, those, those EC war books, as we discussed before, written by... Harvey Kurtzman or Al, Al Feldstein, uh, they, they showed the brutality and inhumanity and sometimes hopelessness of war. They gave a usually a fair portrayal of the people on the other side. But the stuff coming from Atlas was the sort of thing that you would expect uh, from a, uh, a comic book about war in the 1950s. It was very hyper-patriotic, purely adventure-oriented, and somewhat jingoistic. The final category of titles that we'll look at from, from Timely was, uh, well, I'm not sure what to call this category. It's kind of sort of science fiction. It's kind of sort of horror, except no one can say that word. Uh, they were anthology books, you, usually with several, several stories, standalone stories in each issue, very rarely with any recurring characters. Uh, sometimes there was a science fiction setting. Um, sometimes there were science fiction monsters. That's where Jack Kirby's monsters would show up. Uh, and sometimes, like I said, it was sort of... Uh, kind of sort of lightweight compared to before the uh, CCA horror stories but you couldn't say horror you couldn't say terror but you could say mystery right it's very mysterious what's going on you had journey into mystery mystery tales adventure into mystery and the world of mystery. You also had mystic, which sounds kind of like mystery, and mystical tales. You had strange tales of the unusual, strange stories of suspense, and just plain strange stories. Not to mention uncanny stories that will hold you spellbound. So no vampires, no werewolves, no zombies. No one said anything about mummies. So we can see a couple of uh, mummy-oriented uh, stories, or at least of um, um, Egypt-oriented stories. Also, um, there's a lot of people walking through walls. Apparently, like, if you're going to go uh, right up to the edge before you actually get scary, uh, somebody walking through the wall, I guess that's what 
that's what qualifies. Or people walking around upside down. You know, you can't have uh, you can't have ghouls eating somebody's face. You know, uh, you can't have someone uh, <clears throat> decapitated by a buzz saw. But holy crap, someone's walking through that wall. That's mysterious, isn't it? Uh, and then I saved the uh, saved the best for last. Just plain good old Marvel tales. Again, somebody walking through stuff. All right, well, now I want to look at a title that came out later in 1956 from Atlas. Um, <clears throat> just a few months in, actually, I think it was, well, several months in, I think it was in October of that year, which is interesting timing, as you will see. So it was called Yellow Claw. And I guess that uh, if you were going to try to fit it into a genre, it would be action, uh, the action genre, or, you know, like spy stuff. Uh, Yellow Claw was a character created by Sax Romer, who, who had created Fu Manchu. And he's basically another Fu Manchu. Um, Romer had written a novel called Yellow Claw which I'm assuming must have been in the public domain because Atlas was able to jump on it, take advantage of it, and use the title. In this book, <clears throat> excuse me, that was written by Al Feldstein and illustrated by Joe Manili, who was doing a lot of Atlas stuff in the 50s. So it's a typical yellow peril type story where the inscrutable and evil Chinese person is the villain and it almost seems as though you can just look in the picture at any time and tell who's the villain because they look Chinese right except there's something very very different about this one very different and very significant what's different is the hero you see Yellow Claw who is an evil mastermind plotting to take over the world, like you do, is opposed by a handsome, dashing young American FBI agent from California whose name happens to be Jimmy Wu. You see, he's, uh, he's Chinese-American. He's Chinese-American in 1956 and 57, and he is portrayed as not speaking in pidgin English. He is not portrayed as being mysterious and inscrutable and the other. He talks like an American guy because he is. Um, later on, uh, about, uh, about a decade later, I think this is 1967, in an issue of Captain America, FBI agent Jimmy Wu is introduced for the first time to Colonel Nick Fury of S.H.I.E.L.D., and he will then go on to be a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, a top-level S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, for many years after that. And, in fact, has shown up a couple of times in the Marvel Cinematic Universe already, first in Ant-Man and the Wasp, and then uh, in the, uh, well, at the time I'm recording this, upcoming Disney Plus series WandaVision and here's a scene on the right from that show with FBI agent Jimmy Woo uh, talking with Monica Rambeau remember her from our Captain Marvel discussion anyway um, very significant character he is portrayed as from the beginning from 1956 as heroic and as in charge. In fact, the original series, the Yellow Claw series, clearly had him, you know, outranking the white uh, police officers and detectives who were, uh, uh, well, who were serving with him. He was the guy in charge. He was shown as being very intelligent, um, being very clever, able to get out of traps, and so forth without 
really any of the stereotypes that had previously been attached, for the most part, to Asian or Asian American characters. Even, and you can you can rewind this and take a look at it, even to the point that in the Yellow Claw series and when he was first introduced in Captain America in 1967, as kind of, uh, I suppose, a subliminal way to show he's one of the good guys, he is colored differently than the other Asian or Asian American characters in the books who were given a yellow or orangish tint. And he is not. So on the one hand, you know, yay, they didn't do that with this heroic character. But on the other hand, it's almost as though they were trying to subliminally whiten him to make him acceptable for audiences from the perspective of the colorist, and I'm sure it was an editorial decision. And it's kind of unfortunate that over time, that got reversed. Like in this picture here, here's uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. agent Jimmy Wu rescuing the Black Widow in the 1970s. And he has, he has succumbed to the, uh, the colorist's prejudices. Well, that's where Atlas was in 1956. And I'm going to go ahead, go ahead and hand you a spoiler here as to why I'm focusing on where things are in this year. Sure, like I said, the beginning, beginning of the year, that's when EC went out of the comic book business. But there's more to it than that. The fact is that October 1956, which is the, the very same month that Yellow Claw debuted with Jimmy Woo as the protagonist, October 1956 is the beginning of the Silver Age of comics. Not because of Jimmy Woo, although that certainly helps in retrospect, but for, for other reasons that we're now going to work our way toward getting into. First, though, we're going to take a look behind the scenes specifically at DC Comics. Now, here's a picture you've seen before, and we've talked a lot about the first two guys, which are Harry Donenfeld and Jack Leibowitz. But uh, even though we've seen this picture, we haven't talked about the third guy, uh, who is Erwin Donenfeld, the son of Harry Donenfeld. Now, Erwin Donenfeld, in 1948, when he was 22 years old and had just graduated from college, was brought into the family business uh, as a partner, a partner to his father and Jack Leibowitz in national publications. And throughout the 1950s, he's going to have a very prominent spot. He's going to be the editorial director of DC Comics uh, through the 50s and then into the 60s. However, within a couple of years after his dad, Harry, passes away in 1965, Erwin Donenfeld is going to be squeezed out just like so many other people have been. But Jack Leibowitz is still going to be there. Now we're going to talk about some of the DC talent in the 1950s, most of whom we haven't mentioned before, but all of whom deserve more than mention, really. And we're going to start with this guy, Dick Sprang, who was the, uh, the main artist for Batman from 1943 until 1963. So for 20 years, both in uh, Batman... Uh, the comic book and in detective comics. And in fact, he, uh, his style would sort of define the character for this whole, this whole period. During this period, he was doing the artwork and Bill Finger, remember him, the uncredited co-creator of Batman, was doing the writing. Dick Sprang, like Bill Finger, got no credit, right? Every, every issue featuring Batman, said Batman by Bob Kane. 
And beyond that, really, uh, in almost all comics, no credit was no credit was given. Some some creators like uh, Charles Moulton, alias William Moulton Marston, um, got uh, got their name next to their character, but but most didn't. And if you were working with characters someone else created, then you were pretty much anonymous to the general public because there were no credits. If you've ever picked up a comic book, uh, you'll, you'll notice that in almost all comics, when, when you open it up, on the first page it tells who wrote the story, who drew it, who inked it, who penciled it, who colored it, and etc., who the editor was. But that didn't start happening until... The, the late 19, uh, mid to late 1960s, early 1960s. Didn't happen until the 1960s, okay? So um, Dick Sprang sort of defined the visual look of Batman and Robin during the Golden Age, most of the Golden Age, and uh, into the ensuing ages, and also defined uh, the look of Batman's arch enemies uh, of the Batmobile and so forth but even people who who loved Batman and and bought the comics and read them had no idea who this guy was it wasn't until the 1970s that uh, he started to get some recognition when they started having a lot of comics conventions and a lot of the uh, a lot of the stories about the creation of the characters and uh, what had happened to them since behind the scenes started to come out. Now, Dick Sprang's Batman was kind of, uh, well, he had an almost perfectly squared jaw, and he was kind of blocky looking. Uh, quite different, really, from Batman as he first appeared in 1939, as drawn at that time, actually, by Bob Kane, right? So he's... Uh, a mysterious figure of the night in 1939-1940, and you'll notice that uh, his ears get shorter and his cape gets less bat-like. Well, uh, just to kind of follow the story about the appearance uh, of Batman beyond Dick Sprang, and we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. We'll talk about some of this stuff in more detail later. But uh, the next major change in Batman's appearance came... The, uh, the year after Sprang stopped drawing the character, uh, and uh, that was the modification of the yellow circle that has the bat in it, rather than just the bat. kind of looks like the bat signal, which had been around for a long time. So, very minor uh, addition, and subsequent artists were, were drawing him less sort of, well, like I said, blocky looking. Uh, 1969, Batman's, uh, once Robin left and went to college, Batman's ears, for some reason, started slowly growing. Almost issue by issue, they got a little bit longer. So that by 1970, when Neil Adams was drawing the character, he had really long ears, again, as he had in the beginning, and looked a lot more bat-like and was a lot more sleek and uh, that that image we'll talk a lot about Neil Adams down the road but <clears throat> that image was sort of the defining image of how Batman would look for the following 20 years starting in 1970 but uh, back to Dick Sprang once he started getting some recognition for his contributions uh, as Bill Finger did although unofficially uh, finger from DC until 2014. Um, Sprang was able to um, kind of make a make some money in his in his golden years by doing paintings that recreated covers and scenes from his golden age Batman. Here he is at uh, 80 years of age in uh, 1995, showing the uh, a, a print for uh, Secrets of the Batcave. Wayne Boring would define Superman in the 1950s. He took over as artist in 1950. 
1848, near the end of the Golden Age, although he had done some some pinch hitting uh, for s- several years previous here and there for Joe Schuster. But he took over uh, in 48, and he would, uh, he would be the Superman artist, the Superman artist for the most part, uh, all the way through the 1950s, and again would define the look. Now, Boring's Superman had a huge torso. That's one of the things that really stands out. But uh, another significant thing uh, about Boring's Superman is that it kind of brought into focus the modern look of Superman's costume, which would be really the Superman look from then on. There have been occasional tweaks here and there. But for the most part, Wayne Boring's Superman is what people think of when they think of uh, Superman, at least so far as the costume goes. So for a comparison, here on the left is Superman as drawn by his co-creator, Joe Schuster. And over on the right is Superman in the same pose, actually, by, by Wayne Boring. Well, um, as long as we're striking that pose, let's take a look at the same pose as drawn by Kurt Swan, who took over from Boring in 1959 and would be the main Superman artist for over a quarter of a century, all the way up until 1985. So the entire Silver Age and uh, a good part of what's sometimes called the Bronze Age, we'll get into all that later. But for a very long time, this, uh, this Superman is a little bit sleeker than Boring's Superman. He doesn't look like he's going to topple over from the size of his own chest. The, uh, the facial features of this Superman were very distinctive as drawn by Swan. Um, really, Boring's Superman almost looked similar to C.C. Beck's Captain Marvel slash Shazam. Um, These facial features became so closely associated by fans with Superman and by editorial that on the occasions when someone else would draw Superman in the pages of other comics, if he was making a guest appearance or something, they would actually have uh, they would have Kurt Swan go over the pencils and and, and erase other people's face and put his Superman face on it. So there would be that consistent look. Well, Wonder Woman was the third DC superhero and the one of only three superheroes overall to keep their own titles from the 1940s into and through the 1950s. So let's take a look. Uh, let's take a look at who was drawing her. Uh, Robert Kaniger was doing most of the writing, by the way. H.G. Peter was the co-creator of Wonder Woman. That's Harry George Peter, who was originally from California and early in his career had been a, a cartoonist for the San Francisco Chronicle, which is, uh, if you'll recall kind of where one of the places where comic strips got their start. Then uh, in his late 20s, he had moved to New York City. Anyway, uh, he had uh, co-created Wonder Woman. If you'll remember, uh, we looked at some of the correspondence back and forth between him and Marston over what the the costume, the uniform was going to look like. Um, he, He continued drawing Wonder Woman into the 1950s. If you'll recall, when Wonder Woman first came out, some people at editorial didn't like using uh, H.G. Peter because he was kind of old-fashioned. He was a lot older, uh, in some cases like 30 years older than some of the other artists. And his Wonder Woman had kind of a 1920s look to her. And you can kind of see that uh, in in the pictures uh, that I show. And see, she maintained that appearance the whole time that Peter drew her adventures. So on the uh, lower left down there, that's the splash page. That's what you call the first page. That's all one big picture. Um, 
That's the splash page from the very last issue of Wonder Woman that H.G. Peter drew, which was issue 97, and that was in 1958. So you can see uh, that her, um, her form, her facial features, and for the most part her costume were unchanged since 1941. The only real uh, change was that she had gone from boots to sandals. Well, Peter's story uh, is, is not as sad as some of the people that we'll look at who work for a long time on a character and then get squeezed out because the editors are looking for a fresh look or new blood. No, H.G. Peter died. Maybe that's not such a happy ending now that I actually say it out loud. But anyway, um, after doing issue 97, H.G. Peter died. He was, after all, 78 years old by that time, which means he was in his 60s when he started doing Wonder Woman. Well, obviously, there's going to need to be a new creative team, and there was. Uh, Ross Andrew came in to be the penciler, uh, and Mike Esposito came in as the inker. Now, Peter had done his own inks, okay, so he did the whole show. Uh, Andrew and Esposito worked together a lot down through the years on different projects. They were kind of a, kind of a team. Ross Andrew, who I think was from Cleveland, it's amazing how many comics creators come from uh, Cleveland. I mean, if you think of a place outside New York where most of them came from, Cleveland probably wouldn't jump to mind. Uh, Andrew was the uh, son of Russian immigrants who had uh, left after the... Uh, the Russian Revolution. And Esposito was an Italian-American from New York City. Anyway, they took over, and uh, immediately there was, uh, well, there was a noticeable change in the artwork and appearance of Wonder Woman, even though the costume was pretty much exactly the same. So these images are from issue 98, which was their first issue doing a uh, doing Wonder Woman, and you can see that um, her figure looks a little more um, realistic and less cartoony, and her face and certain aspects uh, of her figure look much more like a woman of the late 1950s uh, would be expected to look, as opposed to someone from 30 years earlier. And this would also be sort of the defining um, image of, of Wonder Woman for decades thereafter with a, with a brief and, and very unfortunate interlude in the late 60s that we'll talk about later. So these guys uh, did Wonder Woman's uh, adventures for almost a decade from early 1958 until late 1967. All right, well, there's the... Uh, there's the creative teams, at least the artists, and I mentioned uh, some of the writers from the uh, 1950s uh, run of DC's Big Three. Now, let's look at some of the other folks. And we'll start with this guy who should be familiar to you because we've talked about him before. Julia Schwartz, often uh, known as Julie Schwartz. He was the guy that uh, was involved with Mort Weisinger with uh, one of the, the earliest science fiction fanzine, and the two of them set up a literary agency in the 1930s that specialized in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. And they actually represented uh, people who were or would become huge names in those genres from H.P. Uh, Lovecraft uh, to Ray Bradbury to Robert Block, who would go on to uh, write a book called Psycho, as well as write several episodes of Star Trek. Then, when last we saw Julie Schwartz, he had, uh, uh, he had uh, dissolved the literary agency and followed his friend uh, Mort Weisinger over to All-American comics, which was in the process of being completely absorbed by DC at the time. 
So like his friend Weisinger, he became an editor at DC Comics and would be, would be an editor for a very long time. By the mid-1950s, he had, uh, he had demonstrated quite a lot of uh, skill in his editorial position and was starting to have a lot of influence on the direction DC Comics as a whole was beginning to go in. Now remember, he had a, a background in pure science fiction, in science fiction uh, literature and, and the pulp magazines. And he had represented people that wrote science fiction novels, right? In fact, um, when he decided to uh, go work uh, with his uh, former partner, Mort, he had never even read a comic book. He stopped in and bought three. One of them, I think, was a Wonder Woman issue, just to kind of see what it was all about when he went to apply for the job. Well, he moves the, the books under his direction more toward a sci-fi orientation. And uh, just one big example of that is the character Adam Strange, who is uh, from... Uh, it's the, his adventures aren't even set on Earth. He's a guy that lives on another planet. And so it's very kind of like Buck Rogers uh, type stuff. Uh, first appearing in Mystery and Space, but then taking over Strange Adventures, uh, which I mentioned earlier when we talked about the books DC was doing in 1956. I said there's going to be a change there. Strange Adventures becomes Adam Strange adventures. I don't know uh, if his name, I don't guess his name was chosen to fit the book because he appeared somewhere else first. So that's just one of many examples of the uh, science fiction orientation that DC Comics was beginning to take under Schwartz. Allow me to correct myself though, Adam Strange isn't from another planet, he's from Earth. He was an archaeologist who was examining some ruins in South America when a mysterious theta beam, a transportation beam, zapped him off to a faraway planet, the planet of Ran, where he met a, a woman who was a native of the planet named Alana and fell in love with her and uh, began working to defend the planet ran from various threats, eventually figuring out how to go back and forth from there to Earth. Now, if that plot sounds vaguely familiar, that's because it is essentially the exact same plot from John, uh, from Edgar Rice Burroughs' John Carter, Warlord of Mars. 